Chances are, you've heard the saying, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Super tank. It refers to Jim Jones, a cult leader who gave his followers cyanide-laced punch, resulting in the mass murder-suicide of more than 900 people. But why would so many follow him to their deaths? Well, today, we're going to take a look at what life was like in the People's Temple cult before the Jonestown Massacre killed over 900 people. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other infamous historical stories you would like to hear about. Okay, let's all remember to watch, but not drink, the Kool-Aid. Whoever coined the expression, women and children first, was definitely not thinking about Jonestown. But nonetheless, Jones and his loyalists served cyanide-laced flavor aid to Jonestown's youth before anyone else. Some adults even orally administered cyanide-filled syringes to children. According to a survivor, many adults lost their will to live after this incident. Tracy Parks, a survivor who was just 12 years old at the time, claimed there was child labor at Jonestown. After Jones's gunman shot Parks' mother, she and her sister hid in the jungles of Guyana, while the rest of Jones's followers drank the poison. Jonestown ultimately claimed the lives of 909 people, a third of whom were children. In 2008, CNN learned Jones had started ordering and receiving shipments of cyanide in 1976, two years before that fateful day. These shipments are strong evidence that he had been planning that day for years. In fact, it's especially macabre, given that the majority of Jonestown residents had yet to move to Guyana in 1976. That is, he was still bringing in new followers knowing what he was planning. To legally buy cyanide, Jones secured a jeweler's license, as jewelers could use cyanide to clean gold. Then, he started experimenting. Six months before, Jonestown's doctor wrote the following to Jones. Cyanide is one of the most rapidly acting poisons. I would like to give about two grams to a large pig to see how effective our batch is. The infamous day ultimately took place on November 18, 1978. But Jones held rehearsals first. Known as White Knights, Jones would shout through the loudspeakers that surrounded the Jonestown complex. White Knight, White Knight, get to the pavilion, run, your lives are in danger. Jones heightened his followers' sense of danger by telling them how outsiders were coming to take them out. Even worse, Jones had armed people waiting in the jungle. To the followers, these rehearsals seemed far too real. However, it turned out the guns were firing rubber bullets, and it was all a ruse to terrify the people who lived at Jonestown. Next, Jones brought out supposedly poisoned flavor aid for his followers to drink. No one perished during white nights as the drinks were safe to consume. After the drill, Jones returned to the loudspeakers, saying, Now I know I can trust you. Go home, my darlings. Sleep tight. Though the People's Temple preached abstinence from drugs, Jim Jones himself reportedly disregarded this tenet and freely abused them. Terry Buford O'Shea, a survivor of the Jonestown compound, believed those illegal narcotics may have even contributed to Jones's mental demise. O'Shea later discovered that Jones was using to manipulate his followers. According to her, Jones's followers didn't know he was an addict. She claimed that substances were anathema at the temple, and residents weren't supposed to use them. She said after the fact, she learned that Jones had been drugging some people to keep them from trying to leave, to keep them from trying to dissent, and to control them in different ways, all unbeknownst to the masses. It was after the arrival of U.S. Representative Leo Ryan in Guyana that reportedly instigated the terrible day of Jonestown residents. Inquire into the uh, health and the welfare of American citizens who are here. Ryan, then the state representative of California, had received complaints about the settlement. Family members of Jonestown residents and some of the cult's defectors had notified authorities of the happenings at Jonestown. One of those defectors was Deborah Layton, the sister of one of Jones's most trusted cronies. Layton snuck away from the compound in Guyana and went to the embassy to tell officials what she knew. After listening to many concerns and stories, Ryan and 23 others boarded a plane to the small South American country. Among them was Jackie Spear, who was then Ryan's legislative counsel, and later became a state representative of California. Spear said that after waiting two days for Jones to let them into the compound, they interviewed Jonestown residents and witnessed seemingly normal behavior. However, a resident passed a note to Don Harris, a reporter for NBC News who had accompanied the congressman, saying that the residents wanted to leave. According to Spear, 
More and more people wanted to leave, and it became clear that one plane wasn't going to be enough. The congressman decided he was going to stay behind and take the next airlift out. It was so emotionally raw. Sadly, the reports of Jones stockpiling weapons turned out to be accurate. After U.S. Representative Leo Ryan and his group attempted to remove people from the Jonestown compound, Jim Jones sent gunmen on a tractor trailer to stop them. They opened fire on Ryan, a few journalists, and cult members, with 10 others shot and assumed dead. Earlier that day, 11 people left Jonestown in the morning. They had no idea of the horror to come. According to escapee Leslie Wilson, it was a slave camp run by a madman. Though they had come to Jonestown expecting an egalitarian paradise, the reality was dramatically different. Wilson called their 30-mile trek to another town a walk of freedom. Jones wasn't just violent with outsiders. Survivor Loa Johnson Cole said that Jones once pointed a pistol at her while she fell asleep in a meeting. Terry Buford O'Shea remembers Jones holding a gun at her. O'Shea recalled that Jones also beat people for a range of infractions, which varied in severity. The worst beating she witnessed was when somebody was accused of being abusive towards children. Jones took hold of a rubber hose and proceeded in front of others to beat this man's privates. Hey, Weird History, we've got a message about Curiosity Stream. From award-winning exclusives and originals, Curiosity Stream features 35 collections of hand-picked programs by their experts. Curiosity Stream features thousands of documentaries and TV shows with such topics as history, nature, science, food, technology, travel, and more. You can stream on any device, anytime, anywhere. It's just $14.99 for the whole year. Check out the link in the video description below, or use the link curiositystream.com slash weirdhistory with code weirdhistory to sign up. To paint himself as a Jesus-like character, Jones frequently healed people at his services and even claimed he could cure cancer. He also alleged he was a psychic who could see events that had yet to unfold. Laura Johnson Cole said that while she believed in Jones and his healings at the time, she later learned the truth. It turned out Jones had staged his antics and cult members had helped set up Jones's psychic moments. Though these allegations remain unproven, Jones and his followers may be responsible for more deaths than the ones in Guyana. In fact, some believe the People's Temple were behind as many as eight prior to their relocation to South America. In one such instance, a follower named Truth Heart had purportedly perished from congestive heart failure. But later investigators have suggested that her cause may not have been so clear-cut. Some temple members have claimed that Jones facilitated her demise after she started to disagree with him and expressed her desire to leave the cult. Supposedly, Jones ordered a People's Temple nurse to give Hart something that could induce a heart attack. Jones then predicted Hart's heart attack as a show of his clairvoyant powers. In 2003, Dr. Philip G. Zimbardo, a psychology professor at Stanford University, theorized that Jones might have learned some of his control techniques from George Orwell's novel, 1984. In fact, in his 25 years of research and extensive interviews with Jonestown survivors, Zimbardo found several remarkable similarities between Jones's methods and those portrayed in the famous novel. For example, Orwell's idea of Big Brother may have existed in Jonestown, as Jim Jones made cult members spy on each other and used loudspeakers throughout the compound to continually broadcast his voice. Jones also forced his followers to give him information that he could later use against them, which is similar to what happened to the main character in 1984. Also, many who read 1984 remember Newspeak, the propaganda language used in the novel's fictional dystopia of Oceania. Well, Jones adopted an analogous measure by making his followers thank him for food and work. According to Zimbardo's research, Jones even commissioned a song that his followers were required to sing at Jonestown about the advent of the year 1984. Jeff Ginn, an investigative journalist and author of the book, The Road to Jonestown, Jim Jones and the People's Temple, said in an interview, if Jim Jones had been hit by a car and killed somewhere toward the end of the 1950s, he'd be remembered today as one of the great leaders in the early civil rights movement. Jones's charisma, along with his convincing blend of Christian and Marxist beliefs, attracted many people to the People's Temple. The vast majority of his followers were African-American, as Jones claimed to be advancing racial equality. In addition, the church had connection with the Nation of Islam and the Black Panthers, and Jones worked to end segregation in places such as restaurants and movie theaters. Jones also adopted and raised children from diverse backgrounds. 
Jones initially pitched the vision of Jonestown as a paradise, free from the inequality present in the United States. However, this was not the reality at Jonestown, and just like his psychic powers, his belief in civil rights may have never been anything more than a ruse. The choice to settle the People's Temple in Guyana was intentional. Jones needed an English-speaking country with a large black population and a socialist government. Aside from Guyana, Jones's only other option was Grenada. However, another party ultimately outbid the People's Temple for the plot of land in Grenada. So Guyana it was. And Guyana benefited from the deal with Jim Jones. The land the People's Temple used was previously an area that prompted a conflict with Venezuela. The Jonestown settlement gave Guyana an advantage when it came to potential future conflicts with Venezuela. If Venezuela decided to come after the land again, they would have to deal with nearly a thousand American citizens. After Jonestown, the remains were transported back to the United States, but some were unable to be claimed by relatives. Many people at Jonestown had changed their names, and though some had records of their real identities, not all did. Some took on the last name Jones to show their loyalty to Jim Jones, while others assumed traditional African names. This was a popular practice among African Americans at the time, independent of Jonestown, and the primary reason why many of the Jonestown victims went unidentified. Others changed their names to support the ideologies of Che Guevara and Lenin, the former leader of the Soviet Union. Allegedly, Jim Jones outlawed the name Linda after a woman with the same name defected and left the cult. However, it's unclear who, if anyone, changed her name because of this decree. So what do you think? Why do you think so many people follow Jim Jones? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.